folks, we're, uh, we're here today in corrections again. I'm going to do a short uh, lecture for you. So let me get up here and put a few comments up in here. You know, you can remember that you always can count on contacting me through my private email. And it's kind of good to do kind of redundant things. If you really need to talk to me, um, email me here or you can call me. Or you can message me through the course, through the uh, online, you know, uh, email within the course. So, whichever way works for you. We're working on corrections, and this is the third uh, learning module that we're working on. And uh, so, this is really devoted to the history of corrections. So, we'll be talking a little bit about this. And it's broken down and it's in probably a little more organized form <clears throat> that you'll like better if you look at the um, PowerPoint that's going to be uh, in with this um, learning module. It'll be right below my uh, video. So we'll have a video here on YouTube followed by a uh, PowerPoint on this same topic. Well, in the early history of corrections, uh, if we go back into prehistory, uh, the Code of Hammurabi is one of the first ones that we uh, generally consider to be uh, uh, a kind of a pointing, you know, where we can look to and see what was being done. And quite frankly, it was extremely advanced for its time. This was in 1750 BC, and so the uh, code was divided into several sections. Uh, it even had some areas that were considered proportionality in our modern times. Uh, and so what they said is that the, basically the punishment fit the crime. Uh, and uh, that was much better than some of the things that happened in the Middle Ages. It's often also called the Dark Ages. And then even in the Old West in the United States in the 19th century, there was really only one punishment for any crime. You know, horse thievery, hanging. You know. Uh, steal somebody's stuff, hang them, you know. Uh, even to the most brutal kind of things is uh, a slave runs away, hang them, you know. I mean, everything was hang them, you know. So uh, that was a bad period in time. Uh, but this uh, Hammurabi came way before uh, anything uh, in modern centuries, and yet it was divided up nicely into different uh, parts. Uh, and uh, su supposedly somewhat at least proportionate so that for lesser crimes the penalty was less than for more serious crimes. Well this was followed by a draconian era and this kind of went through uh, long periods of time. Uh, basically classical Greece started it in the 7th century uh, BC uh, and so this is a code that had certain legal procedures and punishments for offenders, such as um, stoning, stone someone to death, uh, or, you know, this was when they would hang people on the cross back then. And the Romans, as we know, were big on that because of uh, what happened to Christ. Uh, Justinian, though, of the Roman era in 534 uh, A.D., compiled a code which is really uh, very well thought out and it is a uh, basis for most of modern uh, criminal justice and uh, so they used uh, torture, slavery uh, and uh, they actually would either banish someone or they would put them on these ships as uh, on rowing crews and this type thing and so this was uh, you know, like a precursor to what we see in a lot of our uh, criminal law today is that at least there were different penalties. They were arcane penalties, but they were different for different kinds of crimes. So they're starting to divide things up a little bit. Uh, and I think probably they needed the manpower, so they didn't uh, lean so much on uh, killing people for a period of time because the Romans had expanded so much into so many parts of the world that, that they needed manpower. And so it would be a waste of resources to kill somebody. So 
Um, that's something to consider because we see that in modern era. Uh, quick example, jump forward. Uh, Tyson Chicken down in Arkansas got in some trouble because they were using a lot of illegal immigrants and the um, immigration authorities swept in there and took all their uh, uh, illegals and uh, you know took them off to prison or jail or something until they sent them back to Mexico. So they were just kind of stuck because they didn't know what to do to process chickens. And so they made a couple of phone calls and I think at that time Bill Clinton was actually a governor. So they call him and they dream up this idea well, what if we could send you some prisoners from some of the prisons, you know, the ones that are on their best behavior, and see how that works out? So they would bus prisoners from some of the prisons over to a chicken processing plant, and they would process chickens all day, which is nasty work. We have that here in Indiana, actually. Uh, they have chickens and geese and a number of other things. Fish, we even have fish that are grown on farms now. Sometimes they're grown inside a big giant warehouse and so they have to have people to clean the fish and they'll have hundreds of people that are cleaning ducks, geese, chickens, fish, you know all this and it's a menial type job but for people that are in prison it's the day passes quicker uh, they get paid a little bit of money, more money than they would ever get just sitting in jail or prison uh, and so it worked out, it was a tremendous success so uh, they've started doing this more and more and just about every prison today has some kind of work program because it helps to defray the costs of the prison and, and it keeps people busy and only the worst of the worst are not given some kind of work to do. Well anyway, uh, in Europe many of these legal sanctions in the Middle Ages then were you know, just brought forward from the Roman period and they had a thing called Lex Telonius, that's L-E-X-T-A-L-I-O-N-I-S. So Lex Talonius. Probably spelling it wrong, just a warning. Yeah, I am. Okay, so there's another I right here. Okay, so Talionius or Talionis. Uh, and so this was what we call retaliation today, retaliation, okay? And so basically what we're having here was trial by battle, okay? And a lot of time, uh, you know, a, a, a king or a governor or somebody in an area didn't know who was right. They had a lot of, you know, arguments. Well, he did this to me. Well, he, I only did that because he did this to me. So they gave him the right to fight things out so they could avenge himself uh, and uh, under the law of retaliation. And their theory was, well, God will let the good person win. So they would fight it out in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Little guy like me, 5'2", uh, as they said in Rudy, five foot nothing, uh, would have to fight some six foot tall guy that was a knight or was able to handle himself. Uh, and so you know what the outcome was. Well, it must have been that he had God on his side. He must have had God on his side because he was born tall, born strong, born with all these skills, you know. Uh, and so basically, uh, that was a foolish idea, but that was what they did back then. Well, then as this evolved, then the people could uh, have basically a champion. And so you had all these roving knights that would rove around the countryside that had fought in the Crusades and different things like that, and they were kind of unattached, and uh, basically they would go along to these different cities, and they would fight on behalf of different people. So I could hire my own knight to fight this battle for me against the other guy or his knight. Uh, and so it started to develop or change and, and so forth. So... Uh, this started to develop into what we would call secular law, which was a public law through a uh, feudal type of system. And then it evolved even further from knights to attorneys. And so what ended up happening is you still had an advocate, you had a champion for you, but it was your lawyer. And so it started moving to the courtroom, which the court was the king's court. The king at that time was the judge jury and executioner. So basically 
the where we come up with the well I've got to go to court today well court was the king's court that was the only court there was so then over time started to break away and become the court would be where the judge was who was appointed by the king to clear this up because more and more things were happening it's becoming more complicated so you have to have more judges so then you got to figure out well we got to develop some districts so the big cities will have judges then we'll have a roving or circuit riding judge that would go around in all these other small communities and tie things up uh, and so they would go from place to place and they would hold court uh, in a tavern or they might hold it in a local mayor's office or something like that there was no uh, established building for the courts at that time. And here again the kinds of uh, crimes and the sentences would be a lot of them would be death, torture, or corporal punishment. And when we say corporal punishment that's where you'd see the guy in the stocks like this and everybody's throwing rotten tomatoes at him and stuff and uh, you know a number of different things like that. The dunking chair was usually uh, the punishment of choice for women. Uh, there was such a mixture of law, of you know, you shouldn't steal your neighbor's pig, with uh, things like superstitions, like witchcraft. So a woman could get burned at the stake, for example. Uh, treason was really big. You get a guy like in Braveheart, William Wallace, who they would bring him up on a table, pull all of his intestines out, they cut him in the stomach, and, and then they take his legs off and you know then they'd say confess your sins you know and uh, he would not confess so then they cut his arms off you know and it was just a brutal thing and then at the end because they believed in deterrence they took the leg to Scotland and hung it on a pike and then they put the head on a pike in um, London on the Thames river and then maybe the uh, arm was stuck over in Wales and uh, another part was in Cornwall and you know just all over York would get another piece and they put it on a pike and said this is the body with a sign you know this is the body of William Wallace the treasonous you know which he didn't believe it he was tra a, a traitor because he was Scotch he was not English so you know and that's the age old thing we get into that and uh, some of the things that we look at in terms of you know what is a crime what isn't a crime uh, based upon your different interpretations it's just like today one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter so it's hard to say which is what and what's what uh, but I think probably one standard uh, measuring stick for ter uh, terrorism is you know are they killing innocent children and women and this type thing if so then I think that's a pretty good, solid definition of terrorism. Well, I digress, as I usually do. Uh, the church was very dominant during this time as well, and the church had its own uh, courts and sentences, uh, and they basically um, were the biggest institution. They were bigger than the government back in that day, and so the church had their own laws, and there were crimes, and and then at the other uh, case, on the other extreme, if someone had committed a public offense that the, that the king wanted them for, then they could claim benefit of clergy. So what that meant is if they could get into a church somewhere, uh, then they could hide in that church and not be punished as long as they were in that church. Uh, kings would respect the church and would not go in uh, to the church and try to take out uh, anyone that was hiding in a church. So uh, there were five early European punishments. These include the galley slave, imprisonment, transportation, corporal punishment, and death. And so galley slave meant that they had to work on ships, uh, and that happened from the time of Greece, Rome, and then uh, basically up until about 1770. They would be pressed into being sailors on a ship, and so they would have to help, you know, put the sails up. Sometimes these are little kids, 14, 15, vagrant kids, and they're like, well, you're not doing anybody any good. You're just a weight on society. We'll put you in the Navy. And so those early kids uh, that were put into the Navy, they did small things like they ran around with little buckets with water 
gave the other sailors a drink. But quite frankly, they also uh, served on these big long cruises where they'd go from uh, England all the way to Tahiti or somewhere like that. I mean, they served as a sexual object for some of the sailors, quite frankly, which is pretty gross. But a 14-year-old boy up against a 40-year-old man uh, didn't stand a chance. And so they would engage in all kinds of sex acts as part of their, their service. And then when they ended up uh, being adults, and they now that's the only life they knew was to be a sailor. And uh, so it was their turn to do this to other people. So it was, sad, it was sad, it was very harsh life, uh, and um, so it didn't, didn't work very well for a lot of people. Well, the other thing was that they had these short sentences where, you know, we've seen in the stocks, like I said earlier, uh, this went on a lot in the 1800s. Then they started looking at uh, different ways of using prison. They used it for debt. Uh, Charles Dickens has written a lot on that because Charles Dickens was actually uh, forced to live in a debtor's prison with his father. His father owed debts. He's just a little kid. He's like eight years old, but he's living uh, in a poor house, which is actually a form of prison. Uh, and they had to work uh, while they were in there to kind of earn their keep, uh, even the children, everybody in the family. And so it was pretty harsh and cold and nasty. Uh, and then the next thing that they tried was a thing called uh, transportation, transportation. And what that was is they brought criminals to Georgia and then later on when we broke away in the you know 1770s they started transporting them to Australia, New Zealand uh, and Tasmania and so they would populate these foreign regions with prisoners and so a lot of times um, people were uh, basically party pioneers uh, and this was better than being in a prison or hanged or, or worse being tortured to death so uh, a lot of your big countries like Australia uh, and uh, Georgia the state of Georgia a lot of their early uh, pre-existing uh, ancestors were actually prisoners that were sent there as a punishment uh, another thing is that when the revolution came along, Britain was more or less overrun with prisoners. They didn't know what to do with them because they couldn't send them to Georgia. And there was a gap in there when they couldn't figure out to take them to uh, Australia. So they started sticking them in what they called hulks. Hulks. And what a hulk was was an old broken down warship or even a merchant ship that they would pick up and they would... Um, put it in the Thames River, okay, and they filled it with prisons, and it was disgusting, dirty, nasty, uh, and they just hung there for uh, four years, and here again, Charles Dickens in uh, Great Expectations, where Pip had that uh, interaction with that prisoner, he had just come, uh, he escaped from one of those hulks, swam to shore, and um, Pip helped him, so that's in the the book uh, Great Expectations written by Charles Dickens. So most of what Dickens wrote about was based upon uh, the experiences of life in the 19th century uh, in England and it was a it was a harsh reality, it was rough uh, and so it was interesting. Well public punishment was what we called shaming was often used for minor crimes so any kind of thievery or uh, larceny were often punished by uh, being held up to ridicule and uh, put in the stocks in the middle of town. Uh, they might be forced to sleep in the jail during the night and then come out and be locked in these uh, uh, basically wooden uh, structures. You've all seen them. Uh, in one of my presentations I've got a picture of one where the guy's got his head in there and his arms are stuck in there and you just got to be like that all day long. Well, I don't know about you, but I have to go to the bathroom about every couple of hours now that I'm up in my 60s. So what do those poor guys have to do in that situation? Well, they just have to go right on the spot. And that holds them up to even more ridicule by the people. And that's when they start throwing food at them and things like that. So then we have this next period, which is called the Enlightenment. 
and uh, in the Enlightenment. We will uh, cover that in a few minutes. We're going to stop here for a little break, come back with another YouTube presentation in just a few minutes. Thanks for watching.